So my talk today, again, I'm Addie Patterson. I'm one of the um, other physicians who treats patients in the Huntington's Clinic along with Dr. McFarland. Um, I'm also very involved in this technology called neuromodulation. Primarily, we use it in our clinic for diseases other than Huntington's. Um, but we have implemented neuromodulation for several of our Huntington's patients in our clinic. And it's been in worldwide use for several years. So I'm going to talk about that today. So this talk is kind of shifting gears from uh, future potential to what is available now for the right patient with Huntington's disease. So our goals today are to talk about what is neuromodulation in the first place, um, what is deep brain stimulation, which is one form of neuromodulation that I'll be focusing on, how useful is this therapy for Huntington's disease, who is it right for, and what are some new tools that are up and coming in deep brain stimulation. So what is it? So neuromodulation is the alteration of nerve activity through targeted delivery of a stimulus, usually an electrical stimulus, to specific neurological sites in the body. So this is a very technical definition, so it helps to see some examples. Some of these therapies you're probably already familiar with. For example, spinal cord stimulators that are in fairly widespread use for people with chronic back pain. Vagus nerve stimulators are a relatively common therapy for people with epilepsy or seizures. Um, bladder stimulators, gastric stimulators for gut motility, and then deep brain stimulation, which is probably less familiar to you all, um, but will be what we're primarily talking about today. So what is deep brain stimulation? So this is a video um, that we'll loop through as I'm talking. So deep brain stimulation is a surgical therapy that's performed by a neurosurgeon. Two holes are drilled within the skull itself, and two electrodes are implanted to specific targets deep within the brain. And flexible wires, essentially serving as extension cables, are connected to a battery in the chest, which is essentially a pacemaker type battery that provides uh, the electrical stimulation that will go through the wires, through the electrodes in the brain to those deep brain targets to affect their functioning. So deep brain stimulation is an implant paired with a programming that is specifically customized to an individual patient. So the initial programming is performed in the clinic with a neurologist who sets up different parameters in response to the impact they see on the person's symptoms and the person's response to what they're feeling. In certain cases, the patient actually would go home with a remote control like this, and they're able to make certain modifications on their own at home, such as turning the therapy off, um, turning the intensity up or down, and switching between programs that are preset by their neurologist in the clinic. So deep brain stimulation is really cool, kind of the bionic person. Um, it's not for everybody. Uh, but what does the research say about deep brain stimulation in Huntington's disease? So if you scour the literature, there are 107 articles published before 2021 about deep brain stimulation's use in Huntington's disease. Um, so there is a review article that was compiled by a group in Milan, Italy, and they looked through these 107 articles and chose 20 that had really high quality data that looked at patients who had this technology placed between 2004 and 2018. So these 20 articles covered 42 people with Huntington's disease. Um, one of these 42 people was a patient treated at our center. So the average age of these patients with Huntington's was age 44 years old. The average length of time that they had had Huntington's disease was around seven to eight years and the patients were followed up for up to five years after the implant of the deep brain stimulator. So it's important to note that in these studies and in general, the goal of the deep brain stimulation therapy is to be palliative. What that means is to focus on 
alleviating or improving a bothersome symptom, but it's not a curative therapy. In these studies, uh, people who were chosen as candidates for deep brain stimulation had two important things that were, um, that were screened. So one, severe chorea, that's the abnormal involuntary movements that are very common in Huntington's disease, um, its namesake. So severe chorea, despite medication treatment, typically this was at least two different classes of medications. So the chorea was severe and disabling despite best attempts at, at medication treatment. And they were stable overall, so in good physical health, and their other symptoms of Huntington's didn't have to be non-existent, but they had to be stable. So cognition, mood, and other symptoms had to be stable in order to undergo the surgery. And of course, it's a brain surgery. I mean, I showed you the, the image in the video. It's invasive. Um, so there are some risks that were identified in the research in Huntington's disease. And so they were largely the general risks that occur with brain surgery. So bleeding, one out of the 42 patients um, incurred bleeding in the brain. Four out of 42 incurred infection. And that can either be at the battery site or the superficial or deep sites within the brain. Um, seizures and strokes we know can occur with deep brain stimulation, but fortunately those did not occur in any of the 42 patients in, in this study. So severe chorea, I thought I would include this video just to give, uh, to give everyone a sense of exactly how much chorea do we consider severe chorea. So I would say this is on the milder side of severe chorea, and most people who would undergo deep brain stimulation surgery um, have chorea that's even worse than this. So what were the outcomes? So the primary symptom that is helped by deep brain stimulation is chorea. So that was the goal, and that's what was seen in this research. So chorea in these 42 patients improved between 20% to 74%, but most people got more than 50% improvement in their severe disabling chorea. And it's important to note that it wasn't just a temporary benefit, it was lasting. So the, in the studies where they had long-term data, the benefit lasted at least for three years without waning. So what about the other symptoms of Huntington's? So other movement problems, people with Huntington's can have slowness, muscle stiffness, um, which we call rigidity or dystonia, trouble with their walking and balance. So those symptoms showed some mild benefit at first, um, but the stimulation did not provide any lasting benefit over time. So those symptoms that typically gradually worsen as Huntington's progresses also worsened as the person's Huntington's progressed. What about overall functioning? So if you have severe disabling chorea, and that is improved by 50%, is your functioning in society and in your life at home significantly better? Results on this were mixed. Um, probably there was not dramatic improvement, and so why would that be? If you think about Huntington's, it's not just a disorder of chorea. Oftentimes people have significant um, mood, behavioral, cognitive symptoms that might really limit overall functioning. So the overall functioning was not dramatically improved. Swallowing, actually, and this is a little bit surprising because a lot of times we think with brain surgery it can actually worsen swallowing. But in the case of Huntington's, there was actually a trend toward improvement in the symptom, probably because chorea itself can sometimes impair swallowing. And so if you improve that, then you may improve swallowing overall. Cognition remained stable. And this is a really important point, because again, brain surgery <coughs> doing something to the brain can oftentimes worsen cognition. And in people who already have some baseline changes in their cognition, that was a big worry but cognition remains stable in these 42 patients, which is important. And mood and emotion and behavior were really not as well studied, um, but there were no dramatic changes reported in those areas. So what else was observed with this study? So one main finding, um, another take home, was that there was a lot of room for improvement in the actual programming of the DBS stimulators. So even, I mean, these were all academics, you know, researching um, 
DDS, publishing the outcomes of their, of their data. So these are all talented neurologists, experts in their field. They still used highly variable programming settings in each of these patients. There was not an agreement in what um, settings uh, or parameters were to be put on the neurostimulator to be most effective. <clears throat> and thousands of possible combinations exist, so it's not something that's easy to do. Um, the other tricky part is that stimulation side effects are relatively common because like Dr. McFarland was mentioning with gene therapy, there are always off-target effects. So here you're delivering an electrical current to the brain. You want it to go to that specific brain area where you've put the stimulator, but it can spread around. And if it spreads to certain areas, it can cause temporary side effects that you have to adjust around and work with. Um, so those side effects were common. They're not necessarily a problem because we can work around them, but it can be tricky because a lot of the symptoms are motor symptoms that mimic other symptoms of Huntington's. So if your doctor programs your simulator in a certain way, you might have more muscle pulling, and it would be difficult to interpret whether that's from a change in your Huntington's or from your stimulator. So new tools in deep brain stimulation. So again, this is um, not a cure for Huntington's, but it's pretty cool overall um, in the field of neuromodulation is the development of smart systems. So the line in the middle of this slide is kind of where we are now. So everything above the line we can do now. Everything below the line is where things are headed with DDS smart systems. So step one in creating a smart system. So a smart system means a system that can not only deliver stimulation according to what your doctor programs in, a smart system can actually listen to your brain signals, figure out what is wrong, correspond that, you know, to a symptom that you're having, and actually automatically tweak the stimulation in real time in response to your symptom. So right now, we do have smart electrodes and batteries that can record and store these brain signals. We can also identify brain signals that correlate with specific clinical symptoms, so we call these brain biomarkers. For example, in Huntington, we would want a biomarker that's like a Kuliga detector. So do you have some change in your brainwave activity that increases or decreases when you're having increased chorea? So we have these biomarkers for Parkinson's disease. We do not have them yet for chorea, but we do have one patient at UF, and there are probably other patients throughout the world that have this smart electrode and battery with recording capability um, and here we are actually um, fortunate that our patient is participating in research with us to try to develop a Korea detector through the brain signals. And so then step three is taking that data and actually uh, closing the loop so that our smart system can not only detect that biomarker but respond with adaptive stimulation to control the symptoms in real time. So this, even though it sounds like it's in another world, this is actually being done on a research basis for other disorders. So Parkinson's, essential tremor, tick and tremor. So it's very cool and is the future of deep brain stimulation. So in summary, deep brain stimulation is a form of neuromodulation. It can be a useful treatment for people with Huntington's disease who have disabling chorea despite medication and is uh, something that's available right now for patients who are in that category. So I think that, that's all I have for you guys. Um, any questions from anyone now? For, this, for the non chorea symptoms that didn't see an improvement or were like trending towards improvement mm -hmm. over three years, would you typically expect a patient not on that treatment to have, like, for those symptoms to worsen? And so a flat line is sort of an improvement in a way? So you would expect those symptoms to worsen over time, yes. But the problem with the data in these studies, it's only 42 patients. So when we say that there was possibly mild improvement early on and then later worsening, actually the data points are all over the map. So it's really hard to make heads or tails to even suggest that maybe it's slowing down the progression of those symptoms. I don't think it 
you know, personally, I don't think it's slowing down the progression of those symptoms, but we can't really easily interpret that from the data that we have. Yeah, do, you, do you want to say just a couple of things about getting it approved, so the challenges of getting it approved for this indication? That's one of the things, just, just for our audience. So, um, so always a challenge with healthcare system is insurance. Um, so this is a very expensive therapy, um, something on the order of $20,000 plus. Um, it can be covered under insurance um, in many scenarios especially when it's an FDA-approved indication like Parkinson's disease or essential tremor. Um, Huntington's is not an FDA-approved indication, and so we have to jump through extra hoops and hurdles, and depending on a person's insurance, it can be challenging. Um, however, we have had success in several patients before.